One of the great gifts in life is laughter and that thing they call joie de vivre. And I can't think of anybody who is the better exemplar of both of those than George Peary. When he's in a room and laughs, everybody knows you're there, George. And it's a wonderful <laughs> gift. It is a wonderful <laughs> gift. When you are in the theater and I hear you laughing, I'm thinking, oh, we've done something right. Or at least I hope you're laughing at the right places. Right. And that something has been done right. Um, on campus, um, you've had a 40-year career at right. Mars Hill. Came in 1969, and, and today is December the 10th in nine, uh, 2009, 2009, right. Um, I was looking at your, um, your background as I was preparing for today, and you have a bachelor's degree from King College. You have a Bachelor of Divinity from Union Seminary in Richmond, a master's from University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and a doctorate from Emory University, Atlanta. So one can say you really have been well educated. Um, I, I, the thing that always, and I've never asked you this question, how did you get interested in political science? <laughs> when did that happen? It's real easy. Um, I grew up in a household where the church and the state were represented by my mother and my father. My mother was born in China, a missionary kid uh, at the turn of the last century, and she herself would have been a missionary had not some health dilemmas after she got out of college forced her to become a teacher and move to the town that later became my hometown and meet my father there. Um, and, and my father was the son of a politician and he served as a lower level uh, judicial official in Virginia. And, and so, you know, I had the church over here on one end of the table and the state over here. So my own career kind of vacillated between do I go into to church service? Do I go into um, some kind of function with, 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 with politics or, or, you know, with civil society? And, and you it, never it, left. It, and, and I never left, you know? And when people say, how did you go to seminary and then get into politics? Well, you know, it's sort of <laughs> like, it was just a matter of flipping the coin, you know, right. and, and which way it ended. And uh, it, there's a much longer story, but essentially, that was the environment was I grew up in, and um, and how I got here uh, was the same sort of thing. You know, when I got hired, um, my familiarity with with theology, with ethics, with the kinds of questions that the Christian faith asks of people in terms of what is their social responsibility, just sort of fit with what I was doing at the time in terms of uh, my own uh, political growth and development and, 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 and philosophy. And, and so, you know, there was this kind of, there's, there's been this sort of tension, but marriage. And a good one. And a good one. So, so in 1969, you got your master's at Virginia, right. at Charlottesville, and that very same year came here to teach. Right. Now, how did you get here? How did you find Mars Hill? Mars Hill found me. Um, by a quirk of graduate politics, the guys I had very carefully cultivated to be on my uh, graduate committee and to continue with on in a PhD program, after I finished my master's thesis and defended all of that, every single one of them left the University of Virginia. One went on sabbatical, another retired, another took a job somewhere else, and it was kind of like, oh my God, I've spent you know two years putting these guys together so that I could go further, and all of a sudden I'm left seduced right. and abandoned. So a friend of mine who was working in the placement office said, George, there's this letter from someplace down in North Carolina, a guy by the name of Dick Hoffman, who's looking for somebody in American politics who has had internship experience, 
Um, they're wanting, you know, somebody with a master's level who's interested in going on. Would you be interested in, in, and so this came very late in the season. Little did I know that Dick Hoffman had just been elevated to the new deanship, that he was very desperately sort of seeking somebody who could make a very quick decision to come down here. Um, there, was a, there was a selection process, and I ended up down here because he sent a letter to the director of placement at the University of Virginia, and here I came. And that was that simple? Yeah. But you had heard of Mars Hill before that, hadn't you? Actually, I knew it was here. Right. I had driven through as a child. I had come down here. My, my, my mother, a Presbyterian, went over to Montreat, and right. we had, you know, people over there. Um, um, I went to King College, and of course I knew Mars Hill was here was physically. Close, right. but I don't think I had ever been on the campus before I came here to interview. What was that interview like? Tell me, what was, what was it like? I really don't remember. I remember coming down here, and I remember the people, but I don't remember the interview. It was, it was uh, what are you good at? What do you want to teach? Right. What are your passions? Um, what turns you on? Right. Why are you interested in this position? The, the, the kind of... Do you remember your first impressions of Doc, uh, Dr. Hoffman when you first met him? Oh, I liked him. I liked him a lot, and continued to. And the 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 the, the attraction and the liking grew into admiration and a great deal of uh, res res respect and um, um, genuine appreciation for what he meant to this guy. I had no clue, then, right. you know, that he he was here was this sort of whippersnapper guy that had. You know, at, at the time had made some very wonderful movements to get this job himself. Um, but I liked him. I, I like the fact that he was trying to reshape an institution. Um, and I wanted to be in on that. And he offered me an opportunity to not only teach American politics, which I did and, and loved and continued to do so, but he was also offering a new kind of vision for students who came here to be involved in different kinds of situations. And, and I think if, if we talk about this later, his emphasis on getting students outside the classroom, right. his concern for uh, social justice issues, his notion about giving people the opportunity to interact with folks of different backgrounds, of different interests, of different educational levels, um, and to provide the wherewithal for students to do that, and, and institutions that could mentor and, and, and guide them in that process rather than just sort of, you know, go out to the county or go out to, you know, school system and do whatever you need to do there. But there was a kind of structure that then would feed back to the college that I really appreciated. He had a sense of a servant leadership. He used to talk about that yeah. a lot. Did, did you feel that Dr. Bentley shared Dick's view about all of that? I don't know whether Dr. Bentley shared his view. I think Dr. Bentley was a wise person in the kinds of boundaries that he set for himself and for Dick. I think Dr. Bentley was, was prescient in sort of saying to Dick, you know, you handle this part. You do the curriculum, you do the faculty, you do the, 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 the who we are. I will do the board stuff, I will do the public stuff, I will do the day-to-day the, the, the -day bottom line management. And in that sense, I don't think he questioned it. Now, whether he was as enthusiastic or as supportive or made the kind of uh, public advocacy that Dr. Hoffman did around those sorts of issues, 
I didn't see that in Bentley, but I, I, I really did see him being comfortable with what Dick Hoffman did. Did you feel that that working relationship was a good one, for, not only for them, but for the college and for the faculty? Did oh, you? yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It felt good. Yeah, it not only felt good, but I think if you look at the people that were recruited and were hired here during Dick Hoffman's heyday, there's a kind of stamp that that, that coterie of, of, of faculty and staff that got hired when Dick was, 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 was dean that made a huge impression, not only on students, but also, I hate the word branded, but I think that the, the, the college received this idea that from Dick, that we were more than just an educational institution, that we represented a particular kind of set of values that we emphasized, that, that uh, the servant leadership thing, the, the education with an excellence, I think that was, that was Bentley's, the preposition may be wrong, but excellence in education right. were, were yes. Um, there, was a, there was a harmonious relationship between Bentley and Hoffman that I think prior to the financial exigency. What happened? As, as, that's a good point. In the early 80s, when there was a period of financial exigency, things changed. Right. Not only with Bentley, but with Dr. Hoffman. The jobs actually began to change. <laughs> Dick took on new, different responsibilities. Um, and then in 1985, we had Dr. Schmelzkopf actually to come right, in. Right. And so the whole structure changed. How did the college, how were things perceived? What, in what ways did the college change through all of that, do you think? The college changed in many ways in the sense that Dick, I perceive, and, and I still hold to this, and, and, and this is not new here, but Dick was the kind of leader that institutions require in an area and a time of redefinition and expansion. Certain kinds of leaders do flag waving, do rally around the cause, follow me kind of leadership very, very well. Dick was that kind of guy. He, he enlisted support. He enunciated certain kinds of principles that people bought into um, or they became convinced of. Um, he wasn't a very good general in a period of retreat and the financial exigency thing came down and he found himself being involved, making decisions about issues that, that he was uncomfortable with. Um, and, and I think it sort of tested the boundary that he and Bentley had tacitly agreed to. And I think the, 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 the decisions about cutting back on faculty, about limiting what we did, about cutting back on programs. Um, the, 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 the reduction in, it's kind of like the Big Bang Theory, you know, the, the, the universe starts collapsing rather than expanding. And the financial exigency was a point where our universe sort of came to an end. And I don't know whether it's, it, it was a period of retraction, certainly financially it was. But Dick, I don't think, was anywhere near the, the leader in a period of retrenchment, in a period of retreat, as he was when he was calling people forth and saying, let's do this, let's do the other. And I think personally he said, I can't do this anymore. And 
thus the switch and Schmeltikoff came on and, and, and Dick hung around for a while, but he basically kind of gave up that leadership position, that definitional position. And unfortunately, the same thing was happening with Dr. Bentley because he had tried several times to retire, and the board yes. and the board wouldn't and the let board him. Wouldn't let him. Wouldn't let him. And, and, and the board wouldn't let him. So when, actually, Dr. Bentley served 30 years, and that that was an amazing length of time, and there were only three full presidents over 100 years of the college, and perhaps that's a, a view of the maybe he had. Maybe he had stayed in the office too long. Maybe they both were tired or plain burned out based on circumstances that had gone on. Let me jump back just for a moment. When you first came here, you came at a very difficult time right. in, in the history of this country because the late 60s and early 70s were fraught with all the Vietnam right. era and the unrest among students. Students were burning buildings everywhere on co college campuses. You came into a, a situation that was very difficult and your subject is political science. So you were coming into it with a very real finger on the pulse of what was going on. Did you feel that Mars Hill College during that period reflected what was going on in other academic circles in the country? I think the short answer is yes. Um, students went from here to Washington, D.C., uh, protesting the Vietnam War. Um, I got here the year after Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy were assassinated. Um, the Vietnam War became more and more an issue on campus. Um, we were not immune from the kinds of antagonisms that the 60s set up. There was a, it, 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 it certainly wasn't a majority opinion, but it was a significant plurality of students who were saying, this is crazy. Everybody had a friend who had been drafted. Most people knew someone who had either been killed or injured in Vietnam. Um, Did you feel during that period that the college in some way changed with its, its uh, history and method of doing things. For example, it was not long after that that students said, we no longer want this daily chapel, for example. They saw the college being uh, somewhat isolated, perhaps an insular, in, in a mountain situating, situation where maybe there was not a feeling of our being tuned in, that we were behind the times. Did you sense that, that, that those things affected internally the way the college functioned? I don't think it was, I don't think it was any one thing like sort of cultural changes. Um, it, it, it was certainly what was going on within the culture. But also, the institution was changing from a junior college to, to a senior, senior college. That's right. You, you were very early after I that was, change. I was very early on after that right. change. Right. And several of the students that, that I worked with in the Community Development Institute were, in fact, Vietnam veterans. So when, 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 when you're talking about politics and when you're talking about what we need to do in the world, and you've got Vietnam vets in your classes. That's reality. That's real reality. Yeah. And I think a lot of the changes that happened here on campus at that time, particularly as it relates to how we became something different than we were back in, say, the 50s or early 60s, had as much to do with, with our changing from a two-year to a four-year institution as it did with other cultural forces, which, of course, you know, we, we, we weren't, you know, isolated from. But when you, when, you, when you move from a junior college to a senior college, the, the demands for autonomy, the demands for students having more freedom in the dorms, the, the changes in the kind of, uh, um, what was that terrible term we used? Uh, in, in loco parentis. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you know, the the wonderful four inch rule that uh, that existed here that men and women couldn't sit down and you know touch or you right. know be you know. And all that seemed very old and passe by that. Yeah, point. old old and passe. And you know when you when you've got when you've got folks here for four years. Not, not only are they saying, my gosh, we're, 
you know, we're growing up college students who are going to have a degree. Um, what's, what's all this kind of Mickey Mouse junior high school, you can't be touching one another yeah. stuff? So, it, 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 you know, it, it, not, not only was it the, the, the integration of the campus, the, the, the fact that we weren't isolated from external issues of rock and roll music, of drugs, the, the war, of uh, sex, uh, but there was this huge growth in the number of people who were here. Like when you're here three years and four years, you're going to have a different need of the institution than if you're only here two years and you're going to Wake Forest or Chapel Hill or UNCG or wherever it is you go for your final two years of college. And, 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 I, and I think all of that came together in the, in the early 70s to dramatically change this place. Let me talk a little bit about you as a teacher. In the 40 years that you've been associated here, you are one of the most honored teachers on this campus. I don't know whether people are aware of that. You have the Robert Gibbs Distinguished Teacher Award in 2007. In 1994, the Jefferson Pilot uh, Teacher Recognition, which was very nice. And in 1991 and in 1988, you were voted by the graduating classes of those years as being the favorite teacher on campus. And you've had all kinds of grants to do projects from the <coughs> Appalachian College Association, the Mellon Foundation, and all over. So you have had uh, an incredible history as a teacher. And one of the great strengths that you've brought here is, has been not only your teaching, but the outreach that's brought. For example, I remember in the early 70s, you did a course in the January mini term, which I have missed over the years, where you would take students to Washington, D.C. And you did that for a long time. Talk a little bit about that experience and what you wanted the students to do or to gain or to learn by that. You know, how did it work? The January course was, was, was one of those things that uh, began when we started January term. Um, experimental stuff. Um, across the nation, there was a movement to salt up or uh, enliven curricula by having teachers, professors do strange things that wouldn't necessarily fit into a semester of 15 weeks and, you know, lectures two or three times a week and, you know, tests yeah. and papers. And I came up with this idea of taking students to D.C during January. I had some contacts in Washington where we could stay relatively inexpensively. Um, interestingly enough, through my church contacts. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, why, you know, there, yeah. there, there you go again. Um, so I began taking students to Washington and uh, what would happen, they would sign up for the Washington Experience class. They would get credit for it in January. And to make, you know, and, and I did this for 18 years. Uh, even when we didn't have Jan term, um, I made a deal with, uh, you know, deans and my, my, my department chair to say, okay, this is still a worthwhile project, even though we're no longer doing January term. It started out as a, as a sort of three-week thing. Students would come back. We'd meet for a little bit here on campus, then we'd go to Washington for two weeks, and we'd come back here and we'd debrief. That got changed as the Jan term thing morphed into, um, you know, they would, they would do the experience and get credit for it in the spring term. But essentially, we would go to Washington, stay in a student hostel in D.C., in and around DuPont Circle. Um, and I took students. I would set up interviews with people in Congress. I would set up interviews with think tanks. I would set up interviews with people who were doing social justice issues in Washington. Would talk to people depending on what the current issue was, you know, the war, uh, health care, uh, abortion, uh, family planning, uh, education, all kinds of sort of topical issues. We would go around D.C. knocking on I mean, we wouldn't knock on doors, but I would, I would have this thing arranged so that 
On Tuesday, January the 12th, we would go downtown and we would get a briefing at the Defense Department. Then we would uh, uh, go across town and go to the State Department. Then we might go down to the American Heritage Institute, uh, to American Enterprise Institute. And then the next day we would go to Brookings. We would go to, um, um, you know, museums. And it was just really, really cool. I still get letters from students who were saying, Dr. Peary, you don't remember me, but I was on your Washington trip in 1983. And I'm saying, who is that guy? Yes. <laughs> did, did, you, did you have anybody from all those students to do that, to, uh, to actually go into politics? Or yeah, that? yeah. And in fact, um, I've had several students who were on those trips. One, um, you know, two, two, two very immediate examples. One student went immediately after graduation. Uh, he became an AA in a congressman's office. Another student who went on a trip um, did, began doing graduate work and now is working uh, for the National Conference of State Legislatures in, in Denver. Other students who went on that trip have morphed back into their state systems and have become uh, bureaucrats in state agencies one way or another. So in, in that sense, and, and there were a whole bunch of teachers and a whole bunch of principals you know, yeah. in, in education who, who went on those things and they came back and they said, wow. Uh, and and, and it, for, for, for me, it was the kind of expression of, of um, this is what politics is all about. And they come away with all kinds of very cool stories. Um, we were there for two inaugurals, one for, I want to say, Jimmy Carter, another for Ronald Reagan, and, you know, my students were able to get tickets to balls just by hanging out with, you know, people that they met in restaurants and, and places that they were eating and on the street and in conversation. They, and it was just really cool because Washington got demystified. The political process became something that wasn't done by them. It was done by people like me who ride the subway, who eat, who put on their pants one leg at a time. And they're just people. Um, it's really neat. And um, it became more and more difficult as the semesters moved on and I didn't have as much energy and it became more expensive. And Washington itself, even before 9-11, became more security conscious and there, there was a kind of constriction of, of accessibility that, that made easy movement and, and welcoming a lot more difficult. But I think it's one of the, for, for, for me, it's one of the most satisfying things that, that, that I ever did. And it was kind of, you know, just off the top of my head, like, why not just take the students to walk in? You created a wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember vividly also um, you and Bob Kramer here, and we're talking about courses that you taught, ended up doing some film classes together. Right. Tell me about the film. What did you, how did that work, and what did you do? The film class eventually morphed into what we call American culture and film. Uh, when this building was first built, as a matter of fact, Ann Davidson, who was director of, of uh, I want to say media, that's right, whatever it was. Um, Bob Kramer and I, all of us were kind of film junkies. And Bob had done movies occasionally, and uh, I had had some things to do with visiting artists and lectures, as did he, and was involved with uh, some film people in Asheville in a film series that sort of predated the, the Fine Arts Theater, which now is a sort of indie, the highlights indie movies. That's right. So as, as our new curriculum began to evolve, there was this piece that we saw, how do we talk about American culture? And a number of faculty were addressing this in several kinds of ways. So Bob and Ann and I sat down 
wrote a proposal and said, we'd like to show movies to students and then have them talk and write about it and reflect on the kinds of values that, that they see in these films and, and how they relate to their everyday lives. And it became a really popular course and we changed from having students come in and watch 16 millimeter prints to having them come in and see, you know, uh, VHSs and then coming in and seeing DVDs, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the technology yeah. changed. Um, but what was fascinating was, was not only their, their struggle with what American culture was, but the fact that film was an art form that both was a mirror and it, in, in a way, a, 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 a cultural rallying point. And most students didn't, hadn't considered movies as cultural icons or as holding any kind of value or showing anything about the culture. It was just something you did on a Saturday night and we forced them to think about movies. <laughs> they liked it. <laughs> they, did you get any flack from people about the kinds of movies you showed? Oh, of course, of course. And that's always good in an academic environment. Oh yeah, yeah. It was boring, you know. <laughs> Let me ask you another I thing. don't care if it's boring, you know. Why are you bored? Why you are know? you bored? It was always important to ask students when they saw something and they said, it's good, and you ask them, why is it good? Absolutely. Um, you mentioned about technology, and, and I know you were very much important in uh, the colleges transferring into the technological age of uh, internet, computers, and so forth. Talk a little bit about that, because that was that was a process that was going on for golly, ten or fifteen years, and it, we we moved along very gradually as technology itself moved along. How did you first get involved in that? Was it John Payne? What? Well, uh, yeah. I I basically, I had done in, at Emory, I had done some statistical work, well, a, a, a serious amount of statistical work on my dissertation, using the old punch cards, you know, 80 yes. column punch yes. cards yeah. that went ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. Um, and I remember sitting in my lab at Emory, running this stuff from ka-chunk, 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 to I would go across campus, you know, on my bicycle, about a, a mile away, to pick up these huge printouts that went ka-chunk, 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 and, and had to wait for everybody else on campus. Well, you know, that was my first exposure to the, 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 the kind of work and the kinds of things that technology could do. I had done some statistical work in my master's degree at Virginia, but it had all been handheld calculator stuff with tabular things on notebooks that... So, I found that, that I was drawn to using computers and so any new innovation that came along, I kind of played around with it. I, my wife still considers me a geek, but in the geek community, I'm <laughs> almost a troglodyte and you know, don't even talk to him, he doesn't know anything. So it depends on what lens you're looking at. Right. Um, I, I have this wonderful experience of working with John Payne when he was first talking about doing email on campus. He was director of libraries. We he was be. director of libraries at the time. And in the library, he, he, he opened up three, I think it was three, three or four computer stations. And this was so low level. And, and, and low level, I mean, it was something that John did for the library. And, um, Several other faculty people were beginning to hook into what was then the nascent email internet 
through dial-up. Yes. You would have a dial-up system. And that's the way you got on, online. And John put in place a freebie software system. This wasn't university, this wasn't college-wide. But he put in this email system, and I remember he announced it, and I came down very shortly after he started. And a colleague of mine, Kathleen Donald, who taught psychology, was at that time in Australia on a sabbatical. And Jim Lindbergh, a friend of mine in the history department here, and I remember my very first emails. I, I sent both of them the same one, and I went, you know, this is really cool. I can send an email <laughs> to Australia, one block away, and I can send an email to Australia, Australia. all at the same time. Ooh, yes. this is great stuff. <laughs> and and then later. What, what, I, what I found fascinating, because I got on some faculty committees that dealt with technology. Um, I was on the technology committee for a while and was around people who were making decisions about that. I discovered that the use of computers among the faculty, faculty were using faculty grants to buy computers to get software, to network with each other. And I remember a directive that came down from the president's office that said, we don't have a clue how many faculty either A, have a computer, or B, know anything about it, because faculty had basically appropriated this technology long before the people in the big house, because they had this uh, what was that system that they used? Um, they had the Wang system in The Wang system, the Wang system. Yeah. And this was a big centralized server. Right. And they had no clue what was going on in terms of the way that, that faculty were beginning to teach their classes, yes. that uh, the faculty were beginning to you know, send emails to each other, shock, shock, um, and didn't go through the Wang system at all. And so when this directive went out, we need to have an inventory of how many people have computers. The, the president and, and, and the administrative team were really surprised to discover that faculty had used their Title III monies and other kinds of grants that they had gotten to, to, to in, enhance their own capability and, and use the technology that was out there. And in a way, What's fascinating about that to me is it says something about who this faculty is on one hand, but it also it also shows that that um, faculty have an impact on the way we do things. That we 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 aren't totally you know directed from above, and and that's a wonderful example of faculty doing things not so much against the will of the administration, but unknown <laughs> to the, I mean, literally. Unknown. Apparently, when, when this report went in, close to 60% of the faculty had some sort of on their desktop computer that people in, 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 in Blackwell had no clue about it. I remember vividly that uh, Doug Gordon in music, you know, was figuring out how to do computer work with uh, with music music theory, and he set that whole lab up, you know, as the equipment came available, as new technology. Yeah. He did it all by himself. And all around campus, I would talk to people, and they had bought their own computers and were talking. Do you have that? I may, may, may I borrow you or download? I need to. In, indeed, yes. And it was all it was interesting. You're right. It took the fact, it took the uh, administration a long time to come around to realize the value of a centralized system for the campus. Right. And golly, that didn't happen until what the mid to late nineties, right? Least. Yeah, a long. And long it was time. it was really cool because it was kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, we 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 make decisions. <laughs> if it's a good way to teach, if it's a good way to communicate with our students, you know, I'll use it. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it, it 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 worked, and uh, they didn't know anything about it, so it was cool. It was cool. <laughs> one, one of the things that people say about you is they say George is a Renaissance man, and of course, it's, it's in a very real sense, it's true. The other Friday night, I saw you in uh, 
Moore Auditorium singing the Poulain Gloria with the Southern Appalachian Chamber Singers. And you've been singing with that group for a long time. Talk a little bit about how you got involved with them. I know prior to that, well, talk about that first, and then we'll go back to something else. How'd you get involved with them? Uh, music has been a, a, a big part of my life. Again, you know, sitting at the table. My mother was a musician. My father couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. Uh, mother played the piano. Dad, <laughs> yes. I, I love them both. But uh, um, the arts have always been a way for me to get out of my head. I can get in my head. I can, I, I can be, I can be way too stressed out with planning with boxes with what I'm going to do in the legislative process class on Wednesday, September 17th at three o'clock. Um, so they go to a different part of the brain. So you go to a different part of the brain. And, 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 and music, um, I've, I have sung in a choir, been musical probably since high school, uh, got seriously involved in several choirs when I was in college, sang in a church choir, sang in our college glee club, I have been involved in church choirs since, and when I moved down here, I fell in love with um, the mountain tradition of shape notes. Yes. Faso La, you know, uh, which is, a, which is a, a, a Wesleyan revivalist tradition that, that, that has its own marvelous history and is having something of a renaissance. But I got involved in shape note singing with a group of people that, that have been long-term friends. And, um, and several years ago, I just happened to go to a Southern Appalachian Chamber Singers concert and went, whoa, this is really good stuff, and asked Joel if it would be possible if I could join them. We did an audition and he said, come on board. And I've been singing with him for it. about six or seven years. And you know, we do concerts. We're, we're doing some concerts this Christmas. Uh, we've gone to Piccolo Spoleto in How Charleston. How is that? How is oh, that? going to Piccolo Spoleto is really cool. Uh, it, it's interesting when you tell people that you're going to Spol Charleston to- The Spoleto Festival. To the Spoleto Festival to uh, Sing mountain music. It's, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> but we do, we, we do more stuff. I mean, like the Poulain. The yes. Poulain Glory. Very modern, very yes. rhythmic, very uh, uh, atonal, and, and uh, it's very different than uh, uh, Soar Away or Angel Band. Or, and yet, Joel Reed, who is your conducter and conductor of the college choirs, uh, it loves the uh, Renaissance music and the old oh, music. Oh, absolutely. You know, so absolutely. It's a good, good combination. Oh, it's a wonderful combination. Of and. All that and I think one of the reasons I was, I, was, I was drawn to that particular group is Joel, had, Joel comes out of a tradition that, that emphasizes ensemble work, um, getting the vowels right, making sure it's not just you're singing the right note, but he not only wants everybody singing the right note, but he wants everybody singing at a certain pitch, but more important, he wants everybody shaping a word exactly the, the same, same way. way. Because he comes out of a musical tradition that I think can be generally described as the, the, the Shaw School of Choral Directors, that, that basically says, if, if you're making an A sound as opposed to an ah sound, you're going to get a different quality. And if a note comes out as everybody singing A, that's, and that's what he wants, that's cool. But if you have some people saying A and other people saying ah, even though yeah. the notes are same, people are gonna hear it so he works hard on the sound. He works very hard on sound. And it's, it's, it's wonderful after being in some amateur groups where we didn't have that kind of shaping <laughs> and direction. Yeah. Well, let me jump to another of the arts. You say you get out of your head in the arts. Uh, in early in the 70s, I think it was 1972, Jim Thomas told me one day, uh, he says, I'm going to do Enemy of the People. 
uh, the, the Ibsen play, and I said, why did you choose that one? He said, well, uh, the Asheville um, water supply has been condemned for planes coming into Asheville that can't take on water. Right. And he says, this play deals about water pollution. And uh, I'm sure you probably tuned into the fact that Jim was always politically conscious of oh, yeah. the plays he chose very often reflected what was going on in the culture at the time. And he said, uh, guess who's going to play the, the two leads in that show? <laughs> <laughs> And I said, I have no idea. He said, well, I'm going to ask George Peary to play uh, the, the lead, the hero, and uh, Earl Lonegan to play the, the villain. He said, they're brothers. Uh, yeah. But it turns out that the, uh, the mayor, you are the doctor and he's the mayor, uh, doesn't want his town to be uh, told about the pollution of the water, which you've discovered. Right. Uh, because it was going to affect commerce. Right. Uh, it must have been very difficult having people, all a huge cast, yelling at you, enemy, 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 as they did in, that, in those performances night after night. How was that experience for you? Was that your first play here? I don't think it was, because I had, I had done some bit parts in a couple of student things. Okay. And had done, and, and did some things after. But it was a marvelous experience. I had done some theater in, I had done some theater in college. Um, and uh, had kind of let that go, you know. When you get into graduate work, you, you know, you. But I still love theater. But live theater is just marvelous. Well, I know you did two shows. One at um, the Asheville Community Theater, The Best Man. Yeah. Based on the Gore Vidal uh, story, it is a Gore Vidal play. Uh, that was a political, very political, very, very political, about a political, very political, about a presidential election. And then you did for me uh, at Owen Theater, Fiorello. Which is wonderful. Which, I loved it. Another story. Love so you, those plays you've done have all had a political, strong political uh, implication. Um, the Fiorello play was great fun simply because that character was, uh, Fiorello himself was, oh, yeah. was a great, uh, great character. Um, you played, I remember, can hear you now singing Politics in Poker. And a little tin box. And a little tin box. And those things don't have much resonance for today because people don't know what the little tin box now means. But they really do. And they I probably mean, do. How, how would you explain that to a contemporary today, to kids on campus, what the little tin box was? Well, the little tin box has to do with, you know, corruption and taking money and uh, hubris. And uh, it's just not called the little tin box anymore, is it? No, you just call it your bank account. <laughs> It's like, it's I mean, you know, we, we have congressmen who put thousands of dollars in their freezer. I mean, yes, you know, the little yes. tin box. I mean, there, there it is. is. <laughs> it, there it is. There it totally, there it totally is. I have to, I have to, um, Jill, while we're talking about politics, I know um, that you were very active in the Obama campaign right. uh, last year, and uh, Obama was elected. I remember vividly you're speaking to uh, the retired faculty people before the election, talking about the election, and I thought, handle that very well. Clearly, you were working for Obama, but you presented the case uh, in, in a very, in a, in a way that was not in any way sense of proselytizing and saying, you've got to vote for Obama. Um, were you surprised that uh, North Carolina voted for Nova, uh, Obama? Were you were surprised at all that the state went? I was personally delighted that uh, we now live in a blue state um, after having uh, been in a state that's gone, you know, Republican yes. all the, all these all these years. Um, I was delighted. Um, and what about Dole? Were you surprised that she was not reelected? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, she ran a terrible campaign. She did. Yeah, and her uh, 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 Kay Hagan, uh, the, the 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 one ad that Liddy Dole ran questioning Kay Hagan's Christian faith, I think, did her in. I agree. Absolutely. And, you know, again, faith and politics. Here we are, we're back yes, to the same back issue. To the same issue. Um, um, on, a, on, a, on a sort of personal note, it was, it was interesting because um, I did most of my work out of Buncombe County for uh, the Obama campaign. It was all volunteer. I didn't get paid for anything. And it was just very exciting because in all of my years here, a presidential campaign has never ever had an office in Asheville, either during the primary or during the general election. And I can only remember one or two candidates coming through Western North Carolina, showing up in Asheville during primary campaign. Obama was here as the nominee. Michelle was here, you know. Yes. Um, and. Obama carried Buncombe County by 18,000 votes, and he carried the state by only 14. So those of us in Buncombe County think, you know, it yeah. was, 
That made the difference. That made a huge difference. But even in Madison County, even in Madison County, the, the difference between um, the, 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 the votes that um, uh, John Kerry got and McCain, you mean? No. Okay. In a, a, oh, know, I'm sorry. The, the, the Bush Kerry. Right. The Bush Kerry thing. Even Madison County was much, much closer this time than four, four years ago when Bush beat Kerry pretty handily in Madison County. McCain won by like a hundred and some votes, whereas four years ago, uh, Bush had won by close to a thousand. So, you know, even though the plurality and majority was, was, was different, um, across North Carolina, that was the case. The president has been in his office now about 11 months. Do you feel, do you feel he has lived up to the expectations that you thought for him? Uh, personally, yes. Um, I think for a number of um, a, a number of people on the left, they're disappointed in in, in many ways. Um, today, for example, he's re he's receiving the Nobel Prize. He's receiving the Nobel Prize. I in mean, Norway. you know, and you don't and and you don't get that without some sort of recognition of what can be or what people hope you might be able to do. And the very fact that he's been able to pass a piece of legislation that deals with uh, uh, pay equity, that he's been able to get through all kinds of very difficult budget stimulus stuff around issues that, that he really inherited. I mean, you know, the, the bank bailout is not an Obama administration initiative. Uh, he's carrying on. And, sort of muddling through, uh, he's been able to, the, that the House has already passed a bill and the Senate looks like it's going to pass a health care bill. Healthcare bill may First, I mean, presidents since Harry Truman have been talking about this. Um, and this is the first time that anything has even gotten this far. And if you look at the provisions in the health care that are now clearly not even being debated, uh, two years ago we would have said, oh, you know, that's, It'll never happen. So um, there is always a difference between being a candidate and governing. Let me ask you this question. You, you had this incredible interest in, in uh, well, politics and political science in general. Have you ever considered running for office yourself? I have. And uh, at this point in my life, with the kind of energy I've got and what I want to do, I would much prefer to um, uh, work behind the scenes for men and women younger than I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't like to be called at 10.30 in the night and have people, yes. you know, take my head off. Yes. Like, what did you do that for? And when you're a politician, you, you really compromise your privacy. Absolutely. You give up your life, really. Yeah, you give up your life. And, 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 you know, local, I admire people and support people who, who recognize that and do it for the common weal. But they really do give up a life. I notice in your, in your work in, outside of the college, and you've been very involved in all kinds of projects, you know as a writer and as an activist, you've written about term limits a lot and you've talked about term limits a lot at the state and local levels. How did you get involved in that topic and what is it about term limits that, that, that is a problem for you? What, what, how did that come about? Um, that started because I have been interested in state legislatures for a very long time. I did my dissertation on the way state legislatures worked um, and have written about state politics and federal politics, have done international AID lectures on the way American federalism works. And I think the, the, the way the national government deals with the several states is one of the unique and, and uh, um, uh, peculiar institutions and relationships that we have in this country and is a, is a, is a benefit of our Constitution. But to explain this to other people and students is, is um, interesting. So I've been interested in state government. When I did my sabbatical 
in the mid-90s, I hooked up with the National Conference of State Legislatures, and at the time, several states had just either passed or were beginning to implement term limits. And in terms of, of researchable topics, it was something that was, that was new. It was, a, it was an issue that I was interested in looking at. Not many people had written about the stuff then. And um, I was fortunate to be at uh, NCSL at a time when they were interested in exploring some of those kinds of things. And I got a lot of mileage out of the work I did with them on that. And I'm interested in term limits because it's one of those things I think many people see, well, you know, because we don't have, I, and it, it's only been in states where most term limits have gone into effect, where um, um, the state initiatives have passed them. Did, did, you, did you approve of the Bloomberg uh, extension of time in New York? Um, no. <laughs> Is it because it was a personal thing and he had the money to buy that? Or what? Well, I, you know, I don't know how really that worked other than the fact that he was able to get the charter changed. And this is the way politics goes. Yeah. Um, uh, it's interesting because, you know, if, if, if my wishes were horses, I wouldn't have approved the 26th Amendment to the Constitution that limited presidential terms. Um, Republicans were so incensed that FDR, FDR ran over and over and over, <laughs> yeah. over and they kept electing them until he died. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, Eisenhower would have been president another time had he not been term limited. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan would have been elected again had he not been term limited. Uh, Bill Clinton would have been elected again. And you know, you can do all kinds of what ifs. And, in, in those three instances, just, just those three, um, the history of the United States in the modern world would have been very different if Eisenhower had served another term, right. if Reagan had served another term, or if Bill Clinton had served another term. Um, was that amendment ever couched in terms of, like, Cleveland being able to go back after an intervening term? Was that ever discussed? Yeah, that was discussed, and it was basically, at the presidential level, you know, they said, no, you know. That was it. Yeah. And there's a clause in there that a vice president, if he ascends or she ascends at a certain particular time, he, she, he or she can run twice. Um, but if he, if he or she comes on board after a period of time into the presidential term, he or she can only be reelected once. So. Has, the, has the Palin phenomenon surprised you? Yes and no. Um, I, I think the way our party system works, the Republicans are looking for somebody who is both exciting, new, and can articulate a number of their um, um, I ideas clearly and well, and obviously a whole group of people think she can. Um, uh, charisma in politics is, is yearned for. I mean, well, certainly that was true with Obama. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Do you see? Do you see the? Uh, do you feel the country as is headed more right than it has been in the past? Is that a you mean more right as in ideologically? Yes, or ideologically. Right or wrong? No, no, ideologically. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Um, and I'll tell you why. If, if you look at the kinds of changes that have happened since you and I have been here at Mars Hill, women, minorities, African Americans, Chicanos, uh, gays and lesbians, there is a, there is a much wider participation. Uh, the opportunities that are available for, for, for women the opportunities that are, I mean, the very fact that we're, 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 we're taking issue now with politicians' affairs, for example, 
I mean, that's all in, you know, Governor Sanford in South Carolina. Kennedy got a free hand because there weren't women in the press corps. Um, it, we, we, we have a whole raft of new questions that we ask people. You know, family life. Uh, what kind of marriage do they have? You know, the Tiger Woods issue. Politicians and celebrities used to do all this kind of stuff all the time. Everybody knew it. But it was, it, was, it was sort of okay because the parties who were hurt didn't have a voice in our civic discourse. And now I think they do. One thing that happened in the uh, Obama campaign that I thought was, uh, was brilliant from his point of view was the use of the media in a way that not been, for example, uh, all the modern handheld communication. Oh, the social kind of, networking, yes, and, you know, and blackberries. With, with and, young people, and that had not happened before. Absolutely. And I think John McCain probably did not tap into that <coughs> way of communicating. So clearly Obama was ahead, probably by birth, virtue of age and time, because he was a great deal younger. Um, we, we talked a lot about politics. Let's go back and talk a, a bit about Mars Hill College, because the time you have been here, you have been a part of three administrations at the college. We talked a little bit about the Bentley Hoffman era. Talk a little bit about the era that followed, the Lennon era. He was here, Dr. Lennon was here from 96 to 2002, I believe. Um, talk a little bit about that era. How were things different, better, worse? How were they different during that period of time? I left for my sabbatical the year that uh, uh, Max. Max and Ruth came on board. So you were missing the first part of that. So I missed the first part of that. Um, I, I came back in and because of my own probably excitement of what I had learned when I was working in Denver and wanting to incorporate particularly some of these new technological things, email and and, and the like, um, the, the, the beginning of the World Wide Web, you know, researching pre-Google, pre, pre Google Internet. Um, I really wasn't aware of a lot of stuff until um, things began to kind of, you know, not feel very, very comfortable. And as a general rule, I tried to stay out of um, the discussions, the sky's falling, or you know everything is cool. That very often faculty, you know, the chicken littles, and administrations, with their public voice, say we're 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 okay, we're cool. I, I you know. I, but the year and a half away must have given you an interesting perspective when you came back. Yes, yes. I'm sure you were noticing a campus that was somewhat different because of all the things that you had, a lot of new, right. new people yeah. who had come yeah. to campus. There, there, there would be a, a whole new um, group of folks that were hired. Right. Um, there was a sense of uh, hoping that Dr. Lennon Particularly, as, as he articulated a new vision, I do remember this, that he came in and he said, let's reorganize. Let's have four schools. And his, his, his rationale, the faculty um, questioned it first, and then said, okay, we will give you the benefit of the doubt. And faculty bought in, faculty spent a lot of time implementing this new um, administrative structure. It, it was an administrative structure rather than a curricular structure at the time. We tweaked the curriculum, but basically it was an administrative, it was a re, reconfiguration of the way we did business. And I think it was only after we had spent an enormous amount of time 
as a faculty. Reconfiguring ourselves to meet what we considered uh, Dr. Lennon's vision, only to discover that the rewards he had promised, i.e. more money, uh, foundation grants to, you know, um, um, endow the chairs of all these schools, all of a sudden we had spent this work, we had redone, we had rebuilt the house, and there wasn't any more money. Um, and as that realization began to sort of sink in, new administrative initiatives began to be resisted. Um, we didn't trash the, the, the new structure, but there was less and less trust in what the administration said among the faculty, because I think overall the, the, the faculty, and this is because I came into it, you know, kind of fresh because he was, yes. Uh, but I really do think there was this, this sense that, that the, 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 the people on campus had put a lot of trust and faith in his new vision, had spent a lot of effort and time in doing it, and there was no payoff, and we were back to our original problems so why listen anymore? You know, it was it was almost as if um, uh, the the wolf had uh, now the kid who had, the, the the kid who cried wolf, you know, had had said wolf wolf too much, and you know, and so the uh, the 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 last straw with 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 the Lennon administration proposing yet again another kind of windfall just wasn't believed. And it was sort of like, oh my gosh, here we go again. So, and that was it. Yeah. When, in 2002, you took, you became a part of the Presidential Search Committee yes. for the next president. Yes. Uh, that was a huge undertaking because it was a time of great stress internally yeah. at the college and externally too because the, the, uh, the circumstances of the switch in administrations had become a public knowledge in an right. un unpleasant way. Yes. Um, how was it when you all, Dr. Lunsford had become the interim president right. at the beginning of 2002, how was it for you, all of you who were on that committee, it must have been a very different ball game from the usual committee looking for a president. What were the parameters you all set up to find the new president? I think it's probably beyond my um, interest here in getting into that. I think we um, committed to confidentiality, and at this point, I'd like to kind of hold to that. Good. That uh, I didn't know whether you were thinking in terms of whether it would be age range or discipline for the president. What might he come to, from? A man, woman? Were those issues? part of all that discussion, because Dan was already sitting in the office at that point. Right, right. And I, I, I think it would be inappropriate for me because I was a mere part of the committee. I was just a mere part of the committee to, to do a lot of disclosure. It was, a, it was an interesting discussion that John Huff said uh, in his interview about the bringing to campus of Dan Lunsford to begin with yeah. when he came here to be in the edu edu education, education department, um, that Max Lennon had said, when you all bring him here, whoever you bring, uh, man or woman, be sure this person can be the president. The next president. The next president. Yeah. And as it happened, that turned out, that to, be, turned out right. to be the truth. Uh, and I'm sure that nobody would have predicted, predicted that from that earlier in the statement. Right. Um, in near um, close to 2005, you took on an even more complicated job as chairman of the search for the new dean. Um, we, we had gone through a long period of having a sort of stability with uh, the deans from, uh, from, Dan, uh, from uh, Big Dill, I get this right, Dick Hoffman, then Schmeltikoff, then, then Bob Knott, Erlanik was in there, er they were all in there, yeah, yeah. and then suddenly you're looking for somebody new, and by then Dan was officially right, president. Yeah. Do you remember what, what, became, what became your 
framework for searching for a dean at that point. How, how was that different? Would that have been different from searching for a dean in the time of Hoffman and these other folks? Was there any difference at all? As, as I didn't sit on any of those other search committees right. for deans, and I sat on this committee because I was chair of the faculty at the time, um, I can't really say how it's different. All, all, I, all I know is we went through a very methodical process um, of, of uh, looking at applications of, first of all, talking to faculty and staff as, and coming up with, with what we thought were sort of the, the, the skill sets and the values and the interests and the, 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 the commitments that we needed a dean to have. You know, there were, there, there, were, there were things we wanted in a dean that we went after. Um, those were clearly identified and um, the, the, the process I think we went through um, was transparent, open, um, and I was relatively satisfied with that decision. Did you did you um, did you feel that there was a, a, a push or an interest in, in bringing a, a female woman to the this job? Because that had never happened until Nina came to the job. Or was it just chance that she was one of the applicants who was a, a candidate? I do you remember that? I, I don't remember that, and, and, and again, I would use that as another example of how our culture's changed. That, you know, you don't exclude somebody because they're a woman anymore. Right. Um, um, you I, may, go ahead. Yeah, uh, um, she seemed to fit what we wanted. And so it was a good match. Yeah. yeah. When, when um, you mentioned being chair of the faculty, um, and that's been the highest faculty position. Right. Um, and uh, someone who, who sits on the president's council who is in constant contact with the administration. And you, you had that job for three years. Right. That's a long time. What, and a very stressful period of time. What was the dynamic coming at you from the faculty as you dealt with the administration? Um, is, there, is there something that you remember specifically that you felt that the faculty wanted to get across to the administration that you became the Emissary for? I was here, I was here when, and I was chair of the faculty, when um, all the difficulty with Dr. Lennon came down. Um, and I found myself in this somewhat tricky position of not being able to mediate between the administration and the faculty in the sense that I was a faculty, I was elected by the faculty to express the views of the faculty. Right. And in that context, I found myself in a very confrontational position with the administration. Um, the faculty was very upset with Dr. Lennon, and if you look at a number of the actions that the faculty took during that particular time, um, it was not it was not a pleasant it was not a pleasant place to be. And, but they clearly the faculty clearly felt good about your being in that job. They kept you on, <laughs> <laughs> and they also chose a politician. Well, you know, it, it was it was almost very fortuitous. For example, you know, you were talking about. A, 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 a woman being dean, I remember two or three cycles before I was elected faculty chair, Joanne Kroom and I were the two top candidates. And I love Joanne. She's great. I did some team teaching with her. She's wonderful. Uh, she's absolutely, the, the, I think, one of the, and, and if you haven't gotten her on tape, you need to. Um, She's a product of this institution. But I'm absolutely convinced that she was elected because the faculty wanted a female president. You know, and um, that, that, that was very natural. But, but, but the point I, was, point I was making, that during the time I served, 
it was a, it was this confrontational time, and I felt my primary responsibility was to keep the faculty together as much as I possibly can. When I told a colleague of mine who was also chair of the faculty senate of an institution in South Carolina that, you know, of, of one of the votes we had, which was overwhelmingly unified in our faculty, she laughed and said, I just admire that, says, says I can sit my faculty in front of a clock and they can't agree on what time it is. <laughs> So here we had, you know, very contentious yes. uh, issues, and this faculty stayed together. I certainly don't want to take credit for being the person that did that, but it happened while I was in leadership positions, and um, uh, and and I think if you ask my wife. Was I very present to the relationship at that particular point in my life? She would say, no, I wasn't. Yeah. So uh, it was, it was. It was difficult. It was very difficult. It was very difficult. And, and, and at that point, the role that faculty chair played between the administration and faculty, I found myself isolated from the administration and trying as best as I could. To, 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 to figure out how to keep the faculty together in the middle of all this chaos and, and sense of uh, disempowerment, um, mistrust, that at least as a faculty, we had each other. Um, and I feel pretty good about that. Good. But, uh, but it, was, it, was, it was very stressful and um, a difficult time. <laughs> um, obviously, in the in the forty years you've been in this this environment at Mars Hill College, you have become a treasured, my respected person. How do you feel you've been changed by being here? I've probably grown more tolerant. In what way? Um, I've learned a lot. I have learned a lot. I still think, I still recall one of the early, early exchanges. I, I learned from students. I, I really do. I, I learn a lot from students. Um, not only, you know, hip cool music and what movies I should see. I remember before I went back to graduate school, this one guy, after, you know, he probably did CB work in an intro course of mine. And he came up to me and he said, Dr. Peary, he says, I really like this stuff. But says, you know, if I stay in college, I'm gonna be working behind a desk all the rest of my life or working in front of students or, you know, banging stuff out on typewriters and writing reports. And he says, what I really like to do is to get on my tractor and have the sun on my back. And I went, wow. You know? And that thought had never existentially hit me before. That there are people who, for whom being indoors, for example, just is oppressive. I, I love being outside. And I love hiking, and I love, um, but the thought of not having a college career, if you have the opportunity, that guy gave me a gift with that kind of insight. And, and those kinds of things happen all the time. Um, a different way to see the world. Um, international students have, have, have uh, just blown me away with their insights about American government. They go, whoa! <laughs> the, the things you take for granted. Oh, yeah, the things I take for granted that, that American students just go, whoo, just yeah. totally, totally. Um, Korean guy who, uh, who was here, took the intro class, 
and after we were talking about how the Constitution got form formed, and rather than sort of seeing it as a, as a win for the, the Hamiltonians, you know, who wanted cent more centralized government, he came up to me and said, you know, when I look at how the United States has evolved, I think the Federalists won. <laughs> <laughs> I went, yes! <laughs> and I'd never had an American student, you know, sort of say that. Yeah, right. Um, had a different perspective. Had a very different perspective. Yeah. And he had, he had come in, and, I, and I'm always learning from students. It, and that kind of thing changes, changes, me, you. changes me because you, 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 you honor different kinds of experiences in different kinds of ways once you hear it, not only the idea, but also the music of it, you know. The, this, this guy's love of just being outdoors and having his hands in the dirt and uh, growing stuff and seeing things on his dad's farm. What happened to him? He quit. So he did? He, did he quit and um, went back. And went back. If you could change one thing at Mars Hill College other than raising salaries, what might that be? One thing. One thing. <laughs> one thing. It, it seems like for all of my period here, who we are, how we see ourselves, and how we are perceived. I wish there could be a conjoining of that. Um, and I don't know whether it's, it's the, 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 our own vision versus the marketing, you know, whether the faculty represents, faculty and staff represent a different kind of ethos and a different, espouse different kinds of notions than who we say we are. But I wish there could be a greater marriage of how we talk about ourselves among ourselves and how we talk about ourselves out there. Uh, you know, beyond, beyond this campus. Um, Is that ever discussed anywhere? Oh yeah, I think we talk about it here all the time. You know, in fact, faculty do, uh, and I think the administration does. Um, I think very often we get students here who think we are a certain kind of institution, and we're not. And we have these expectations set up that we simply cannot meet. Um, there are other things, but you know, I, 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 I that seems to be a constant. That seems to be a constant. And, and I don't know, but because I don't know other institutions anywhere near as intimately as I do this one, whether that's not a, a congenital problem for institutions like ours across the board. But there is, there is, there is clearly um, a public perception about Mars Hill College and who we say we are vis-a-vis -vis what happens when folks get here um, and who we are as a, as a, as a faculty and a staff that I, that I there's, there's a disconnect. If you, you hear people say all the time, um, there's something special about this place. What is it? I think we care about students. We, I think we value, we value the human experience. We want to have an education. We want to provide students with an education to not only learn skills, but to be able to continue to grow, as I think we have being here. Um, I wouldn't have stayed here had I not felt like I was, I was a different and a better and a 
more complete person um, because of this experience. And I, th I think we model that kind of stuff. Um, I don't see a traditional sort of pour water into students, you know, give them XYZ skills, give them XYZ talents, have them do the degree and let them go. I think we want to say, here are the kinds of questions you're going to be asking, you know. Um, How do you think students and people in general in Marshall College will remember you? I'm always surprised what they remember. You know, what I want them to remember, they don't. You know, what they seem to remember is uh, my writing off the blackboard or my jumping up on the desk or my sticking my foot in the trash can, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, or how excited I got about a political thing that happened, you know. But excitement about politics. Great. That's a great remember. It's a great, you know. It, I may not even remember what the incident was, but they remember when I came in and was going, <laughs> And I think we'll all remember you for a long time, George. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Okay. The world is in tune every spring afternoon when we're poisoning pigeons in the pond. Every Sunday you'll see my sweetheart and me as we I've just been at Jackson Pollock's studio and <laughs> you'll have to forgive me. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection into the starry dynamo of the machine <laughs> of night. <laughs> Who poverty and tatters, high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities. Contemplating jazz. <laughs> they all parade about the goodies that are down the line. In Richmond, Grants, libraries, and the Federals find so sublime. Barclay books, new music labs, genetic centrifuge. Just tell us where we'll come in with a camp that's really huge. This little school, hey, we're no fool, we're very cool. Let's talk grand talk, title <laughs> Fred Bentley says, sit on my lap. There's a database I want to tap. <laughs> oh, nothing is cuter than my laptop computer will always be here on my lap. <laughs> Ukulele, daily, how he was drummed up. 